It's about my grandfather. That's the bottom line. I loved my grandfather. That's that's why I did it. I didn't want his legacy, everything that he had spent his entire life building from that modest pecan stand to the chain at his peak. I didn't want that reduced to these shuttered stores on the side of the road that had been turned into strip clubs and people pointing to them and saying, that used to be a Stuckey's. Welcome to Second Act Stories. I'm your host, Scott Merritt. And I'm Scott's co-host, Andy Levine. The backdrop for today's episode is Stuckey's, an iconic roadside stop that seemed to be everywhere back in the 1960s and 70s. Yeah, anytime my family took a road trip, we always saw the, the, the billboards along the side of the highway that said Stuckey's, 12 miles, Stuckey's, 5 miles. It was the place to stop. And my favorite thing to get there were their famous pecan log rolls. All of that is kind of part of what made it an indelible part of the American experience. Today, the brand is experiencing a resurgence, and that's thanks to its new owner and chairperson, Stephanie Stuckey, who you interviewed for today's show. Tell us about her unusual career path. Well, it didn't start unusual, right? She graduated with a law degree. She became a lawyer and uh, ultimately didn't like a lot of the things that she saw as a practicing lawyer. So she actually shifted to become a legislator in Georgia. But the real second act here is when she got an unexpected call. She was presented with the opportunity to reacquire the legendary brand that her grandfather started back in 1937. And as we're going to hear on the episode, she cashed in her entire life savings to make this happen, basically put it her in, entire future on the line. That's right. All true. It's an amazing story. She's a remarkable lady. So here is my conversation with a bona fide business rock star, Stephanie Stuckey. So you grew up with the name Stucky. I did. And it's inextricably a part of Americana. I mean, even the Simpsons gave a nod to Stuckey's, right? Uh, They went on a road trip. uh, They saw all these billboards that said, you know, stop at Flicky's 500 miles. And the kids were begging to stop at Flicky's and they never did. But did you have any idea when you were a kid? what Stuckey's meant to millions of Americans? I did, but it was more uh, being a part of it because I grew up in that wonderful era when people took road trips. That was really the only mode of travel for most families in our country. This was in the 60s and 70s. I was, I, I'm at the very beginning of the Gen X generation, so I grew up in that era. And back then, air travel wasn't affordable. So families didn't think anything of just throwing ourselves in the back of a woody station wagon. There were five kids in my family. I'm number four of five. And we would drive all over the country for our vacations and go for days and days. And we pulled over at Stuckey's just like everyone else. But while Stephanie's family shared a name with the iconic roadside stop, it was really a name only at the time. My grandfather sold the company before I was born. So it wasn't ours anymore. And absolutely, I have the name. I knew and loved my grandfather. I knew this was the company he built. But we would beg our parents to pull over at Stuckey's like every other family. And we didn't get to just run wild in the stores and grab pet rocks or Wee Wee Willie or the coonskin hats or the rubber alligators off the shelves. We had to pay for it and we had to get our parents to buy his stuff just like everyone else. It was a great experience. Did you ever have a desire to go into the business that bore your family's name? Sure I did, but it wasn't an option. It had been sold. Mm. It, it wasn't ours. So, I, you know, it happens a lot. I've talked to other, I call ourselves three G or third generations of a family business where the family business has been sold and it's, it's not yours anymore. It's only your name. Walk me through the history of Stuckey's. Well, my grandfather sold it, so it was totally voluntary. This wasn't like a hostile corporate takeover. He grew it from a humble roadside stand that sold pecans in 1937 during the Great Depression in Eastman, Georgia, which is in the middle of the state. And jobs were not plentiful back at that 
during right. that era, the one thing that was plentiful was pecans. We happened to be in the number one state, Georgia, for pecans, and it was a bumper crop year, so he started selling them. And he very quickly realized he had a solution to a problem that people had. And that's what every entrepreneur does, right? They, they, they find a problem and they solve it and then they monetize it. Right. So the problem he saw was back then there, there, there weren't any chains on the side of the road. There, there wasn't Loves or TA or Bucky's. Stuckey's was one of the first, if not the first, dating back to 1937. So very quickly, he started developing this concept where you could pull over at a Stuckey store and you could get gas. He had clean restrooms. He had cold water. He would advertise ice water. Mm. You could get snacks. And then, of course, the candies that he made himself. So he grew that. And then over the course of several decades, he went from that one stand to at our peak 368 stores in 40 states he had a candy plant a distribution center a trucking company and a sign painting company that painted 4,000 billboards all over the nation's highways right and so he created this and it was amazing and then frankly he was tired and he was he was ready to cash out he's like a lot of entrepreneurs of that era howard johnson's and colonel sanders harlan sanders they sold and they made a ton of money and that was the pinnacle of success. So he sold to a company called Pet, Pet Dairy Corporation, and they're known for their evaporated milk. Okay. Yep. And mm-hmm. then Pet got bought out in a hostile takeover by a Chicago railroad conglomerate. And th- there were just decades of outside ownership and frankly, mismanagement where the ownership just saw Stuckey's as a subsidiary within a subsidiary and sold the stores for the value of the real estate. And the brand was completely trashed by the time I I had the opportunity to buy it, which was three years ago. Stephanie's grandfather sold Stuckey's and was officially unaffiliated from the company in 1975. As you can imagine, there's more to the story. Also, I've got a book coming out that really has a whole chapter devoted to my father's era. So there is an interesting side to the story that I I don't skip over because I don't love my father and what he did, but it just makes it easier to go through the whole story. Businesses that have been around this long, there's a lot of mess and complication, right? So in 1985, my father had the completely unexpected opportunity, just like with me, to get the company back. It was a hot mess. The Chicago company was facing lawsuits for mismanagement from franchisees, and they basically gave the company to my father, who at that time was running a very successful business with he and his business partners. Three years ago, I got a call from one of my dad's former business partners who said, Stuckey's is for sale. Do you want to buy it? And I was the only grandchild interested, so... I did it. Stephanie's father was instrumental in making Dairy Queen a national roadside brand. So under his leadership, Stuckey's became a meaningful part of the Dairy Queen story. The ins and outs of the story are chronicled in Stephanie's book, Unstuck, Rebirth of an American Icon. It comes out April 2nd, and it's available at Amazon or wherever you buy books. I asked Stephanie what Stuckey's looked like when she took over. Today... There are only a dozen original freestanding Stuckies, and I'm trying to count in my head. I think there's two that have blue roofs. The others have red roofs. They still have Dairy Queen there. So the that connection is still prevalent, well, just in those remaining stores. And so those stores are still part of our umbrella, but they are licensees. We do not own or operate those stores. So they source product from us and we own the trademark and they pay us a fee to to use our name. And they're very much affiliated with our brand, but there's only a dozen of them. So that that's not what's going to revive this company. Right. Yeah. So we had to, we had to figure that out and make a comeback our way. And when I say our, I have two business partners, so I'm not doing this crazy journey alone. But yes, we had to reinvent the brand. I want to hit pause on this part of the story because I want to go back to when you went to college. You went to UGA for your undergrad and then you got a JD from the UGA School of Law. What was the plan when you graduated? I wanted to be a litigator. 
I think like so many people who go to law school, you're enamored with the do-gooder mentality. And I had read Harper Lee's book, To Kill a Mockingbird, and seen the movie with Gregory Peck. And I just thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be Atticus Finch, only a female version in modern times. I want to I want to be part of social good and social change. So I started out as a public defender, first worked in the state prison system, and then I transitioned over to working as a public defender in the city of Atlanta, Fulton County Public Defender's Office, and I was trying cases. It was really exhilarating and exhausting and overwhelming, and I I loved it. I did that for a decade. So after a decade, you made a transition into politics. What motivated that? I got very frustrated with what I saw happening on the ground in the courtroom with all of these criminal justice policies that were being enacted by the legislature, but the policymakers didn't really understand the real life implications of their decisions like to strike your out and minimum mandatory sentences. I still believe this. I think that every case should be judged independently by a judge. Don't let policymakers who are way up high and don't see what's actually happening and don't understand the implications of each individual case, don't don't tie the hands of the judicial system and our judges. Can you walk us through the manifestation of that realization? I thought, okay, I'm going to run for office. I'm going to become a member of the General Assembly, and I'm going to make this my issue. So I got there. I think I did do some good. I I focused more on areas where I thought I could make an impact. I did a lot of work with eyewitness identification, which is the number one cause of wrongful conviction. So I, I got very involved in that aspect where I thought I could actually have an impact. And then I got involved with juvenile justice reform. And then I also got very involved with environmental issues and served on the Natural Resources Committee. So I loved it. I was there 14 years. So talk to me about your one accomplishment that was most impactful. So when I was a state rep, I think the bill I did the most good on, it sounds crazy, but really I believe this, it's the better beer bill. I passed a law in 2005. I say I as the royal we. There was a whole coalition of people who love good beer who were part of this effort to change the laws in Georgia so that we could sell beer that wasn't capped at 6% alcohol. And you cap it at that low level, the majority of really great lagers and ales and all these great imported beers from all over Europe and the rest of the world, we, we couldn't sell them in Georgia. And nowadays, even these small communities have a local brew pub that makes the most amazing beer. And so it took me six years to pass this because we had a lot of opposition from the Christian coalition and mothers against driving drunk. And we had to work through it. And I kept saying, this is about economic development. This is about tourism. This is about promoting small businesses. This is about good food and good drink and enjoying the pleasures of life and moderation. And so we finally got it passed. And to this day, people will stop me and thank me for Good beer. I'm very proud of that. There's nothing like a good beer. Yeah, and now we have a pecan log roll beer, thanks to our friends at at Wild Heaven Brewery, uh, based in Avondale Estates. They also have a location on the West End, and we're talking with them about hopefully scaling that and getting it out in some distributor network. So we'll see it across the state. But it's it's a wonderful beer. We've had three seasons of brewing it every every fall and winter. Right. So hopefully we'll be rolling it out again this year. So you were an elected official until 2012, at which point you went back into law? I did. I decided to run an environmental nonprofit law firm, which is a bit of an oxymoron, a nonprofit law firm, but we were funded through philanthropy. We also got settlement agreements and fees for cases that we litigated and The organization was called Green Law. Unfortunately, they're no longer around, but we represented river keepers and environmental groups throughout the state, citizens, coalitions, and worked to protect Georgia's air, water, and land. It was was fun. I loved it. What was it about environmentalism, sustainability that appealed to you? It's the most important issue facing 
the world. There's nothing more important than protecting our environment. And I don't want to get political and it shouldn't be political. I don't care how you think it got caused as long as you realize 100% severe weather is happening and we better start figuring out ways to prevent it. Talk to me about the importance of economic development as you run your business today. I think rural communities are such an important part of that conversation too. Often we look at what's happening in big cities, but Stuckey's is in Jefferson County, Georgia. It's consistently ranked as one of the poorest counties in the state. And we're really proud to be part of a solution of making lives better in, in a place that's a wonderful place to live and raise your children and, and have a wonderful job at Stuckey's. <laughs> we employ 100 people during our peak season and 75 year round. And I love that. Wow, that's awesome. Kudos to you for doing that. Yeah. When I bought the company, we had six full-time employees. I'm coming up on my four-year anniversary. Yeah. So you added almost 100 jobs. Yeah. It was through an acquisition, which is an easy way. But I say easy. It's not easy. It's really hard to acclimate the culture and get all the processes and systems and accounting software and everything consolidated. But that's how we got our employee numbers up. We That's bought right. a company. We bought a we bought a pecan company that was for sale, and now it's Stuckey's. All right, let me back up for a second. It's 2019. You're working in sustainability, and you get this fateful phone call. That's right. Yeah, I was happy in my little sustainability world. At that point, I transitioned to being head of sustainability for the city of Atlanta, and I I loved my job. I loved what I did, and I got a call completely out of the blue. I was not looking for a career change at age 53. But I think sometimes when opportunity comes calling, you got to answer it. Even if it, we all think that there's just the ideal time. There's never an ideal time to make a radical shift in your life. When it happens, you just have to recognize this is happening and you embrace it. This was not on my radar. I had my life planned out. I was happy with it. I was not looking for a career change. Of all the potential family members who could have been buyers, why you? I was the only one who said yes. 100%. Like I found out later, the others had been approached and said no. I I was the one who said yes. What did you see that they didn't? Well, first of all, I had the financial resources to do it. So that's part of it. I... You know, I really haven't done a deep dive with my siblings or my cousins as to why they didn't. I think everyone's got their own life's journey and their own stuff that they're doing. And for whatever reason, they they passed. But I know part of it, and I think this is a superpower, even though I wish I had spent my entire life leading up to this point in training for this point, I didn't. The one advantage I had being later in life when this opportunity came to me was I did have the funds to buy it. So the good news in a odd, bizarre way is that Stuckey's was six figures in the red at the time, because otherwise I couldn't have afforded it. The valuation was pretty darn low Mm -hmm. at that point. And the owners at that time wanted to sell and I had saved up money. I couldn't get a loan. Nobody would have loaned me the money to buy a failing business. It was failing. And I've learned that it's especially hard to get financing for businesses that have gas stations, which gets back actually to my environmental background. There's all sorts of environmental issues related to underground storage tanks and environmental remediation. And even though we didn't own or operate any of the properties, I, I wasn't buying that. I was buying the trademark I remember talking to some, because I tried to get a loan. I remember talking to some financial groups, both banks and investors, and they said, well, we don't care. Your bank is, your, your business is dependent on fuel and fuel pricing and it's volatile. And so I just could not get the financing. I had to invest my life savings. I was all in. I am all in. Like since then, I have been able to get a loan for the expansion and for the purchase of the manufacturing facility. So I could get a loan for that. Everything I own is collateral, everything, including my life. Wow. I had to take out a life insurance policy 
and the bank is the beneficiary when I got the SBA loan. They require personal guarantee. Personal guarantee is a euphemism for everything you own is collateral and really owned by the bank if you if you don't make your payments. Wow. So you cash in all your chips and you buy back your family's business. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you didn't have any experience running a business. Okay, Literally, so. I watch a YouTube video on the difference between an income statement and a balance sheet because I didn't understand the difference. And here you are reacquiring a company with the goal of getting it into the black. We are in the black. I've learned that businesses have a lot of ups and downs. For the most part, we are profitable. <laughs> okay. And our sales have gone from two to we should hit 14 million this year in the past few years. So sales are doing amazingly well. So you cash everything in, you buy back the business, and now history shows you've made the right moves. Yeah, but here's something you've that is missing in your question is it's not just me, right? My, my superpower is my ability to build a team. I think that's the thing I've done the best, okay. and I am not doing this alone. I have a wonderful business partner, R.G. Lamar. He's a third-generation pecan farmer, so he knows that end of the business. But most importantly, he knows how to read a balance sheet. He knows how to do sales projections. He knows how to put financial packets together. He is the lead on all of our financing, and actually, he and I just transitioned to I was CEO, and he is now CEO, and I'm chair. We're still equals in running the company. And then we've got a whole team now. We've got a sales director. We've got an HR director. Right. There's a third partner, equity investor, who is a marketing genius and helps me with the strategy side of all the communication. So I am not doing this alone. There's right. no way. If this was just me, we would, we would not even be talking. Right. <laughs> There'd be nothing to say. What was the flashpoint? after you got the call where you said, okay, I'm going to do it. It took me about a month. I talked to some advisors and people who had experience in mergers and acquisitions. And frankly, most of them said, don't do it. But I had one friend who said, it's risky, but I think you should do it because one, I know you're passionate and I can tell by how I was talking to him about the business that you want to do this. And he said, there's something that's not on the balance sheets, and that's the balance of the brand, the, the value of the brand. And I know sometimes on financial statements, you will see a line item for goodwill. Mm -hmm. That's so squishy and subjective, right? It's really hard to quantify that. But I knew innately from a lifetime of having the last name Stucky and having people come up to me and tell me their Stucky stories that there was still sticking power to this brand that could be monetized. But more importantly for me, it's not about the money. It's about my grandfather. That's the bottom line. I loved my grandfather. That's, that's why I did it. I didn't want his legacy, everything that he had spent his entire life building from that modest pecan stand to the chain at his peak I didn't want that reduced to these shuttered stores on the side of the road that had been turned into strip clubs and people pointing to them and saying, that used to be a Stuckey's. I wanted us to be the comeback brand that people talk about and say, oh my gosh, have you heard how this brand reinvented itself and became a household name again? That's amazing. I can do that too. There are so many amazing historic brands that were once on the brink. Yeah. I study them. Which one do you draw the most inspiration from? Well, this one I have a bit of a connection to because Ted Wright, one of my partners, was the architect around the comeback for that brand. And that's Paps Blue Ribbon, PBR. Yeah. And that one was really in the dumpster. And Ted was just starting his marketing firm that's called Fizz, marketing there in Decatur, Georgia. And he was hungry for a client and pitched to them and got the account. And it was really through word of mouth marketing because they didn't have a lot of money to run Super Bowl ads or any of the 
marketing campaigns that you associate with these big corporations. They didn't have that type of budget. And so Ted's whole approach to marketing is word of mouth. That word of recommendation from a trusted friend or associate or family member, that is the most lasting and sticking type of marketing anyone can do. It's also the hardest. And you can't just do it from a lot of the traditional forms of marketing. But that's been a huge part of our turnaround. So it didn't take long for the news to get out when the deal happened. And for lack of a better term, you became something of a business rock star. I don't know about that. But I (laughs) I wrote my own press releases, which, by the way, I still write. But I do have my team review them. I'm still doing most of the marketing for Stuckey's. Definitely my own marketing, but I did a press release. <laughs> well, that turned into a whole lot of media coverage. Yeah. I'm, I feel like I've started on second base and maybe some days think I hit a double and I have to remind myself that, no, I started on second base because we're a brand that has a certain amount of brand loyalty and recognition already. I've been very fortunate to have that. Was there a media hit that really opened the floodgates? The pinnacle so far has been getting in the New York Times Sunday section front page of the business section. That was a pretty big deal. That was June of 2022. And that led to the Today Show Sunday morning. So those two are awesome. It's been a year. I'm ready for another big hit like those. But I'm going to coast and ride on that glory for a little bit longer because that was that was a fun hit. Talk to me about the vision that propelled you into this part of your life. I didn't have a vision. (laughs) My, I mean, my vision was my grandfather's dream is not going to become closed, faded stores on the side of the road. We're going to be the comeback brand. That that was what I had in mind. I, I was so naive, really, and I'm glad I was because I might not have done all this. The vision now is... We, we, our team, want Stuckey's to be the go-to pecan brand in the world. We want when folks think pecans, they think Stuckey's. That, that's what we want. That's our, that's our audacious goal. We think it should be on the snack aisles of America. So that's, that's what we're aiming for. That's our, that's our moonshot. Is there any part of the plan that involves Stuckey's being returned to its former glory as a roadside oasis? Or does the future look different than the past? The future looks different from the past. Having said that, I would love it. If I win the lottery and I suddenly have hundreds of millions of dollars, absolutely, I'll buy those old stores and revive them. But winning the lottery is not a good business strategy and not likely to happen. And so the The vision that my business partners and I share is that someday we hope to own and operate maybe three, five at the max Stucky stores that would truly be a roadside oasis that would be very respectful of our past and celebrate the road trip. And there'll be a destination location and a celebration of the brand. But we are developing a business model that relies heavily on our retail partners. So we're now selling to Travel Centers of America, Pilot, Ingalls, Food Lion, Hobby Lobby, At Home, Mapco, Murphy USA, Wawa in Florida, Jet Food Stores, the list can go on and on, Parkers, and Clipper Petroleum. So if suddenly... We start developing all these Stucky stores that are in competition with the people that we're now partnering with. That's messing up our strategy right there. So we're we're very mindful. Like you have to pick a lane sometimes in business, and comebacks are hard. And a critical part of a comeback is to reinvent yourself and understand that there's a reason why what wasn't working wasn't working. Right. And Stuckey's, when we started, we were it on the interstate. There was no TA or Loves or Bucky's. Yeah. Stuckey's was it. That's not the case anymore. That real estate 
is no longer just waiting for us to scoop up and we're not the only brand on the side of the road anymore. So times change and you have to evolve or you're par- you'll perish. So we talked about goals for the brand. What's next for you? Showing that comes, comebacks are possible. And hopefully our story will help motivate others, inspire others to show that they can do it too. And I would love to get to a point where I am financially well off enough to be able to give back to other entrepreneurs. Really the space I would like to devote my energy to after we get stuck, he's totally on the trajectory for growth and success is helping others with their journey and other foodie entrepreneurs and manufacturers, people in the manufacturing and food space, because that's our space. Right. So I want to, I want to help promote others and Americans, American, and, and I'm not like anti global economy. I totally recognize there's a global economy, but I am an American and I love this country and I'm patriotic and I really pride ourselves on being a company that supports other small businesses that are local. Based on all this experience you've had changing careers, putting it all on the line to do what you're doing now, what's the best advice you could give to somebody who's considering pursuing a second act of their own? Be passionate. It's that simple. You have to actually be so passionate about what you're doing because even when you are, there are days when you wake up and think, what the heck? This is really hard. But if you're passionate about it and you just can consistently dip into that inner well of strength that comes only from being super passionate about what you're doing, it's going to get you through it. Be passionate. Scott, another amazing interview. Thank you so much. Thank you for finding Stephanie. Uh, there are so many interesting aspects to this story, but I want to start out focusing on Stephanie herself. So she is a successful lawyer. She is doing her own thing at the age of 53. And suddenly this opportunity to buy back her family brand pops up and she jumps at it. Was this a decision that was driven by logic or driven by passion? Well, one word answer, passion period. Uh, It really wasn't in the cards. It wasn't something that she was seeking out. But when the opportunity presented itself, uh, she saw it as her mission to reignite her grandfather's dream. And to her, I mean, what tell what what says passion more than leveraging your entire future? To chase it. Now, she's clearly a very smart and driven woman, woman. Um, but she also has zero background in retail, zero background in business. How does she make this work and turn around a, a, a brand that was sort of on its deathbed? You know, there's a lot to say about passion and following passion is really important, especially as we've learned over however many, you know, dozens and dozens of episodes we've done. But the passion isn't enough. Stephanie knew that she needed to surround herself with a great team, and that's what she did. And the combination has worked really well. Stuckey's is on the rise. Now, a final question. This is a bit of a personal question, Scott. But since doing this interview, I think you did this interview about six weeks ago. How many pecan log rolls have you actually eaten? (laughs) Well, I can tell you that I didn't have one during the interview, but uh, when I left... I was compelled to stop and find one. So uh, they're great. And if you haven't had one, you should. They're really, really good. There's a reason they're so iconic and historic. I will will have to find one today and have one somewhere. So thanks for that (laughs) suggestion. Absolutely. I'll let you wrap things up here. Sure. If you want to learn more about Stuckey's, uh, you can visit their website at stuckeys.com. You can and should also follow Stephanie on Instagram at stuckeystop. She posts all the time really interesting stuff from her life on the open road. 
And of course, uh, you can also pre-order her book, Unstuck, Rebirth of an American Icon, at Amazon or wherever you buy books. Now, if you like this episode, you may also want to enjoy some of the other episodes we've done featuring female entrepreneurs, Carolyn Curtin from May of 2023, Anna Vocino from March of 2022, and Nassim Alakane from August of 2021. We hope you'll keep listening and subscribe to Second Act Stories on your favorite podcast app. Like us on Facebook, follow us on LinkedIn, share us with your friends. Don't go away. There are more Second Act Stories just around the corner.